Autumn, and welcome to the latest episode of the YA Book Lovers Podcast. The YA Book Lovers Podcast is a monthly talk show about the world of teen books, reading, creative writing, conversations with young adult authors, and other updates from the teen space brought to you by the librarians of Prescott Valley Public Library. Today, we are thrilled to welcome YA author David Elliott to talk about his latest young adult novel in verse, The Seventh Raven. David currently lives in New Hampshire and has written over 25 books for young people, including the highly acclaimed bull and voices the final hours of Joan of Arc. Welcome, David. Thanks for so much for joining us today. We're excited to talk about your latest book, The Seventh Raven. Can you tell us a little about yourself, a little bit about your background? Yeah. Well, first of all, Autumn, thanks so much uh, for asking me, and hello to everybody in Arizona. Uh, I'm in New Hampshire right now, where just the very first signs of spring are happening. So we're we're excited about that. Uh, let's see. What should I tell you? Actually, well, <laughs> to, you know, I really did not set out to be a writer. I it took me a long time to any young person listening right now. You know, the road to where you are uh, never ends. Uh, the road to who you are never ends. And so for me, uh, you know, I did a lot of meandering for many years. Uh, I did a lot of traveling. The world was safer then. And, uh, you know, I was able to kind of travel by the seat of my pants. I I lived in many countries around the world and worked. Um, And then when I got back to the States, I decided I wanted to be an opera singer. Uh, if I can hear people laughing right now, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I did get into a very good conservatory, but in the end, after about three years there, what I decided was what the world does not need is one more mediocre tenor. So, uh, you know, it, when I was singing classical, I can still sing a really good country and Western tune and a good show tune. But and a good folk song, but if I try to sing classical music, somehow it doesn't sound like music. So uh, after that, by that time, uh, I, that was just about the time I met my wife. And um, it was around that time that I started to write. And uh, so here we are today now. That's a cool story. I love the whole opera thing. You traveled a lot of places. Any favorite places that you traveled to? You know, uh, I I lived, as I said, I, I've lived, I may be the only person, Autumn, you know, that has actually gone from the shores of Montezuma to the halls of Tripoli, <laughs> because I was living in Mexico, singing in a bar uh, in uh, Cuernavaca, Mexico. And uh, I, actually, I was singing illegally. And so we got kicked out of that. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, immediately I got a job in Libya. So oh, I wow. keep teaching, uh, but there were never any students. So I spent 10 months there uh, kind of. I don't know what I was doing there for 10 months, but I wasn't <laughs> teaching because there were no students. So I actually did go from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. But, you know, I think every place in the world has something to offer. Sometimes it's harder for a Western person to understand or to get into. But, you know, I think I loved almost every place I lived. I will say, though, that Mexico, for some reason for me, even though I was in places that were much farther away and uh, exotic, at least to me, I loved Mexico. I loved the people. I loved the. I loved what I was seeing visually every day. I loved the food, um, and um, I hope I can go back there someday for an extended period of time. Someday, when all of this is over, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we can all travel again. Looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah. Well, you're in outer space right now from your background, so yes. you're you're already out there. I'm planning. Planning my trips. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so it's 
your background, it took you a while to decide to become a writer. And you ended up writing in a variety of styles for different age groups, including picture books and novels and verse for teens. Who are your children's literature influences and what called you to write for these specific audiences? Oh, well, I will tell you, I, I love the books of Roald Dahl. Um, I, so I don't know if these were my influencers because, you know, I could never approach their craft or genius, but I love them. <laughs> I <laughs> wish I could. So I love Roald Dahl. I'm kind of old fashioned. Uh, you know, I love Natalie Babbitt. If I could write one book as good as Tuck Everlasting in my. Oh my gosh. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, me too. I knew, yes. I knew there was a reason we liked each other. <laughs> I know Tuck Everlasting is amazing. I've loved it ever since third grade. So I found it as a 50 year old, I think. And I, I was amazed by it. You know, it still makes me, this is embarrassing. It still brings tears to my eyes. That, well, it's a beautiful story. It is. It really is. And, and the way it's crafted, all that symbolism of the circle and, you know, the book starts on the road to Tree Gap and it ends out of Tree Gap. So the book itself is a circle. So as a writer, just structurally, I admire it so much. But I also admire her heart and what she was giving to children. Oh, know. I totally agree. I, I absolutely love that book. And I think there's a reason why it's still around and children still read it and adults still read it. And yeah. we can just appreciate all the themes and the structure and it's definitely one of the best stories, children's stories or any stories I think ever written. So I completely agree with you. And I always hold it up. Maybe I, we could let's still only talk about Tuck Everlasting. <laughs> I mean, I could, it's been a few years, but I could still talk about Tuck Everlasting. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I also love it because like all fairy tales, it gives children a choice. They can read it just as what it is, the story of, uh, you know, a young girl faced with this dilemma of living forever or not. Or they can read it at a deeper level. And to me, fairy tales are exactly do, do that. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people like write modern fairy tales, but to me, none of them can approach what Natalie Babbitt did in the Tuck Everlasting. Well, there's just something deeper, I think, in what in what she's doing. Yeah. I mean, it's about, I don't know too many books where the protagonist, where we see her grave at the end of the book. Uh, but right, it's, yeah. You know, right, it's, it's amazing, but it's still so beautiful. It's, it's beautiful because, I mean, she chooses mortality. She chooses, you know, to live the normal human life. Right. So it's it's just a beautiful story. And I think it's, yeah, that's a great influence to have as a writer. I always, I, every book I write, I want it to end the way Tuck Everlasting ended. <laughs> 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 they never do, but I always wanted to do that and Great Expectations. I love Dickens too. Oh, I'm a huge Dickens fan. Oh, yeah. see, I knew yes. it. I'm a huge classic fan. I, I read classic literature all the time, so. Great Anna, Expectations is a great book. <laughs> okay, we got to talk to each other once a week now. I know. We, we have <laughs> a lot to our, our classic reading. I know. I'm like, I got to get back into that. <laughs> we, we have a lot to say to each other. Yes, I agree. I love to talk about these. And most people don't want to talk about my classic books. They're like, that's so boring. But I disagree. And I think there's so much to learn from all these classic writers. And they're just so like, I love their language. Oh, yeah. That's what it's about. Yes, right? it's all about the language. I know they can go into description for a long time, but I love that. Me too. Yeah. So April is National Poetry Month. It is. Yes. And who are some of some influential poets on your storytelling? Well, you know, I, I feel like I should make a disclaimer too, because even though I've written three novels in verse and I have now written nine books of verse about the natural world. Six of them will be published next. I think six are published now and three more are on their way. Oh. But I would not consider myself a poet. 
um, I don't have the training I, and uh, I don't have the discipline really to, to, to do it. And maybe I'm too happy in, to be a poet. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I do read a poetry and um, this sounds so highfalutin. I hope if your teens are listening, they won't like be bored right away. I'll make it short. But um, there's an American poet, he's dead now, named Richard Wilbur. And he translated uh, the plays of Moliere, which were, Moliere was kind of a contemporary of Shakespeare, kind of. And uh, he wrote in French and he wrote in verse. He wrote plays in verse. And when I read those for the first time 30 years ago, I was totally blown away, totally blown away. Uh, and I think more than anybody else, he is kind of behind those these books in verse. But, you know, I'm also very much influenced by Scrooge McDuck. So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. So I read a lot of comics when I was young. My family was poor. Uh, it was not my parents. My mother quit school to marry my dad at 16, and my dad went to maybe eighth grade. So uh, they were very smart people, but not formally educated. And um, there were not a lot of books around. And uh, But we did have a big, huge box of comic books. And sometimes I feel crazy because my sisters don't remember that box. It was a huge vacuum cleaner box filled to the brim with comic books. I don't know where they came from. But, uh, you know, I read a lot of Scrooge McDuck. I still love Scrooge. In fact, oh, your listeners can't see, but a friend gave me one of my, the first edition of one of my favorite Scrooge stories. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in comics, I think are a great way um, to get into reading. They are. And, you know, I think as adults, we think that we can control young people, but we have no control, really. No, no control. No None control. whatsoever. None and, whatsoever. Right. And maybe we shouldn't. So what I mean by that is we put a book that we think a young person should love or should read because it's, quote, good for them, as if books are medicine. And, you know, that it may be a classic or it may be just something we love. And the, the young person, the elementary school kid or the teen May complete. I mean, I remember when my son, somebody gave my son Jane Eyre as a freshman. Oh, I love that book. <laughs> you do. You know, he hated it as a freshman. I can imagine. <laughs> right. Uh, and he could have, I think he could have, he loves Jane Eyre now, but, you know, but he could have gotten more out of possibly a comic book. Yes. I mean, or, you really can. So I know in my own case, when I mentioned Scrooge McDuck, one of the one of the Scrooge stories I love was a retelling of Jason and the Argonauts. And that's how I learned to love. It was a completely crazy version of it. It was so much fun. But that's how I learned to love the myths. And it's possible that if somebody had given me the actual myths at that age, I would not have been interested. But through Scrooge, I learn to love the myths. And I remember when I first then started learning about the real myths, I thought, hey, they, they stole that from Scrooge McDuck. What a work. But, um, and in fact, that is really one reason why I wrote Bull, the retelling of the story of the um, Minotaur. Mm -hmm. So I think we should let kids read whatever they want to and trust them and trust the book, whatever it is that might be saying to them. It could be planting, you know, the Care Bears could be planting an important seed in somebody as much as I wanted to pull my hair out when my son wanted to read the Care Bears. <laughs> hey, you know, I grew up reading, you know, Sweet Valley High and Fear Street. And these were these were great ways for me to get into, into reading. So you never know what story, what what books are going to inspire, you know, kids or teens to, to like reading? Right. And here you are today reading the classics. Yes. It didn't take me long, though. I'll admit. I'll admit. It was yeah. a fast read. <laughs> 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 didn't take me long. I think by 14, I was 
No, actually, probably by 11, I started reading Ella Montgomery. So good for you. Yeah, I love Ella Montgomery. Any favorite quotes from any favorite writers? Any favorite quotes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have, there are two quotes that I love and I try to tell myself all the time. Uh, One is from E.L. Doctorow. And this is what he said. And I have to paraphrase, but I don't have it exactly right, but it's kind of like this. Writing a novel is like driving in the fog at night. You can only see as far ahead as the headlights will allow, but you can make the whole trip that way. Well, that, that's a, a beautiful quote. I really like that. Yeah, isn't that great? You have to really think about it. Right. Writing a novel is like uh, driving a car in the fog at night. You can only see as far ahead as the headlights will allow, but you can make the whole trip that way. And that is what writing a novel is like. And it's also, I would just want to say to any young person that's listening, it's also what life is like. You know, you, especially if you're in a, my own childhood was not always happy. And I know from experience that when you're in a difficult situation, it sometimes feels really hopeless. But you can make the whole trip if you just move ahead as, you know, a tiny step ahead. If you just hang on, you can make the whole trip. So I love that quote so much. And it was E.L. Doc- e. Dr. Rowe. Dr. Rowe. The okay. author of Ragtime. Okay. I think that's his most famous novel. And then I also love a quote from Edna, or uh, uh, from, uh, she's a Southern writer. Oh my God, I'm immediately, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> I will think of it. But, well, she, come back to it if you think of it. Yeah, but the quote is this. You... If you haven't surprised yourself, you haven't written. If you haven't surprised yourself, you haven't written. And I think what she means by that is, you know, a lot of times people will get an idea for a book, and then the whole book is about that idea, and they won't let anything else in because it's about that idea. (laughs) But if you don't let the surprise in, you're going to write a book that's been written a million times before by everybody else. You have to let your unconscious speak to you and let let that take you someplace. And that's, I think, what really makes a great book. Eudora Welty. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great, a great quote because, I mean, sometimes you have to let the characters take over. Right. You just have to see where the story goes. Right. And you have to follow it. Yeah, the follow st- follow where the characters take you, follow where the story takes you. And right. You never know what's going to turn up. Right. I mean, writing is messy. So, yeah, you it's kind of scary to go where they take you, but uh, especially if you don't know where they're going to take you next or what you're going to do. But if you don't do that, you know, the story is so much smarter than the writer. You have to trust, the, you have to really trust where the story is going to take you. And then later you can apply your conscious mind because in the end, you're going to have a first draft that's kind of crazy and messed up. And then you have to apply all the craft stuff. But in, in the beginning, you have to see what you're dealing with. And the only way to do that is, is let everything in. Well, your latest book just recently came out, The Seventh Raven. Um, can you tell us what that's about? Well, um, it's been, uh, yeah, what is it about? I often <laughs> ask myself. <laughs> uh, uh, it's based on a Grimm's fairy tale, The Seven Ravens. And I've always, uh, not many people know that tale, and I've always loved it. Uh, it's about a woodcutter and his wife have seven boys, and they want a girl. And so the girl is born, but then she's very sickly and in fact she's dying so the 
father sends the boys to the well to get water for her last rites. And the boys are all rowdy and they lose the pail. And the father gets mad and says, you know, you're no better than ravens. I wish you were ravens. And of course, they become ravens. But the interesting thing is that when they become ravens, the baby girl instantly begins to thrive. And so, and then the story goes on from there. Uh, but event, but I love at that part of the story, I love what it's saying about when there's too much male energy in the world. And that's the world we're living in right now. So we know what, what that's <laughs> like. Uh, but it's also maybe when there's too much male energy in the personality, in, you know, in any personality. And then in the end, the, that girl grows up and she finds out she has brothers and she's determined to find her brothers and turn them back into boys, uh, turn them back into their human form. Uh, and at the end, in order to do that, she has to make a great sacrifice. And, you know, we don't like to talk about sacrifice very much, but life requires some sacrifice, especially if we're going to if we're going to be our authentic selves, everybody's probably thinking, oh, God, shut up. That's so dreary. But it's not really dreary. Um, and so the girl makes a, a big sacrifice at the end, uh, kind of a gory one, uh, and in fact, changes her brothers back. But the one question I was, you know, writers, you know, when you're writing a book, you're always trying to find out a question. So in Bull, for example, I we know from the myths the circumstances of the Minotaur's birth. You know, that he was half the body of a man, but the head of a bull. And we know how that happened. But the next thing we know, he is in the labyrinth as the monster, the Minotaur. And I was always curious, like, well, he must have had a childhood. He must have had an adolescence. What must that have been like for somebody who was so different? Uh, so in order to write the book, in order to answer that question, I had to write the book. Uh, and in Voices, the final hours of Joan of Arc, you know, I, I became not interested, not, I wasn't interested in Joan the saint, or Joan of Arc the military hero, or Joan of Arc the feminist. What I really became interested in, I had so many questions about who that girl was, just the human girl, what, what it must have been like to be her. And so I had to write the book to find out, but, you know, I ended up with many, many more questions than I, <laughs> than I started with. And then in The Seventh Raven, I sort of thought, I started asking myself, well, what if one of those boys had not been happy being a boy and he loved his life as a raven? What if he wanted to stay a raven and his sister thinks she's doing the right thing by changing them back? And so that it was a tension between those two things, the sister thinking she's doing something good and the boy wanting to stay a raven that kind of propelled the book. Yeah, no, it was a it was an interesting choice. What what happens if someone wanted to stay a bird? What if they wanted to stay a raven? And it, it was kind of an interesting uh, journey and transformation, I think, for both Robin and April. I hope so. I mean, there, you know, I shouldn't say this, but there are so many things I wish I had done in that book that I couldn't quite get to. I don't know why. I shouldn't say that to everybody. Well, I, I don't know. I think every writer read. faces that. You always want to perfect things and go back and you can think of things later on. But that's just, I think, the process of writing. It's, it's never going to be the yeah. perfect end result in your head. So you, you, I'm going to interview you. You talk, <laughs> <laughs> you talk like a writer. I oh. do like writing. Yes. I like to write stories. Yeah. It, <laughs> I, I can tell, you know what you're talking about. Yeah, no, I, I experience a lot of what you're talking about. Yeah. 
I think what we, we don't say enough, I think people get the idea of writers sit down and they da, 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 type, 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 type. Oh, page one, I'm so smart. Woo, page two, yay. Oh. It's so not like that, right? It's so hard. No, writing is hard. Writing is very difficult. Though I love the beginning of just letting letting it flow, letting the story kind of tell me what it is. Yeah, yeah. See? You know what you're talking about. That's exactly right. <laughs> um, the Seventh Raven, um, like you're talking about, is a story about family, sacrifice, transformation. At the end of the novel, you talk about how you use formal poetry to represent each of the characters. Did these poetic forms help you reveal the themes and build your characterization? And what exactly drew you to these specific forms? First of all, only a writer would ever ask that question. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, which I love because I learned early on in Bull. You know, when I when I wrote Bull, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I had never done anything like that before, and uh, I was really driving in the fog at night. But I and the. I knew that I, I knew, well, the book starts this way, if I can remember it. There beneath the palace walls, the monster rages, foams, balls, crying out again and again, mother, mother. No other sound but the scrape of horn on stone, the grinding crunch of human bone under calloused human foot. So, but then the next two words are Poseidon, and he's because I knew that I could not carry on in that lyrical vein for long. First of all, it would get tiresome, I think. But also, you know, I didn't have the chops to do it. Uh, so the next two were, and I had that little poem in my head for probably five years. I didn't even write it down because I knew that was the beginning of the book but I did not know what to do next. I just couldn't get there. It was I was locked out of the book. And then one day I heard Poseidon say, what up, bitches? Two things I've never heard before. <laughs> I've never said what up or bitches before in my life. <laughs> uh, and I thought, oh, no. But that unlocked the book for me. But then I knew, I knew not, you know, so Poseidon kind of speaks like a crime boss. But I knew not, I knew that the other characters couldn't speak like that. So I had to choose some forms. And literally, I had a book of poetic forms. And I just thumbed through it like a phone book, closed my eyes and pointed and said, okay, I'll use that. But I think my unconscious was guiding me because finally I'm answering your question. The forms so... In a way, the forms wrote the book. They really informed who the character was. So I'll give you an example. So in that book, Midos, or Minos, I mean, the king of Crete, is kind of a butthead. Not kind of, he is. And the form that I had chosen for him accidentally is called the split couplet. And it sounds like this. Da-da, 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 da-da. Da, 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 da. So it's five I am's followed by two I am's. Da, da. And that last da, 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 da allowed him, <clears throat> excuse me, allowed him to both have authority. I am the king. Let it be so. The king has spoken. And also allowed him to be a butthead because all those things, you know, so they really helped form who he was. And that was true with all of the characters there. So I I was amazed by that. It was such a wonderful, fun, exciting, and mysterious discovery for me. Uh, and so, yes, to answer your questions, the forms really inform the book. So in The Seventh Raven, um, Robin, I, first I had him speaking in sonnets, but he kind of became insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
uh, so then I I had to I had to figure out something else, and so I kind of tore those sonnets apart and repurposed them uh, in a way that worked better. That's probably more than you ever wanted to know about that. <laughs> no, it was, it's cool. I I love the different poetic forms, so I thought that was really unique, and I kind of like how each one had a different kind of poetry. Yeah, represent them. And so for me, you know, there's that kind of weird narrator voice in in The Seventh Raven. That sort of sounds like the house that Jack built. It's like a two beat line. Um, and to me, that really kept up when read aloud. I, I hope everybody will read my books aloud. Because to me, if you can't hear them, it's not the same thing. I, I kind of write the books aloud, and I hope people read them aloud. You know, with maybe with pals or with a class or with that kind of thing, everybody taking different parts. Because to me, you have to hear it to understand the book. So in that case, you know, I want you to be able to hear da 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 it's like a heartbeat and it's also kind of sometimes annoyingly but usually you know kind of hypnotic or mesmerizing which to me gives it the the once upon a time the fairy tale feeling yeah there is a storytelling element in the story like that narrator voice that you're talking about in a fairy tale yeah. Which I think is is great. And I did actually read a few sections out loud. Oh, yay. Because <laughs> it's it's the natural thing for me to do as well. Like I, I see it and I'm like, oh, I gotta read it out, like like a a play sometimes. Yeah. In fact, there for Bull right now, there there are some plans maybe to get that on the stage. There'll be a long oh, process. Cool. But yeah, I really feel like all these books, all three of the books really need to be heard. And, you know, people can check out the audio books, too. That's true. Mm -hmm. So I also loved the literary imagery in The Seventh Raven, you know, like the glass mountain, the bone key. Yeah. So you have a way with words. Tell me a little about your writing process and how you perfect the language and your stories. Well, I want to, can I say one thing about the bone key? Mm -hmm. So that, with, that's in the original tale. She's searching for her brothers. The morning star says to her, I know where your brothers are. They're in the glass mountain. Here's the key. Here's the bone key. And of course, when she gets to the, here's what I love about that story. That key was never going to work. <laughs> when she gets to the door, she's already lost it. And then she has to figure out how to open that door and has to, that's when she has to make the sacrifice. But I love that bone key because it was never going to work. And I think that sometimes we have to trick ourselves in order to get to the threshold where we need to be. Like if she knew that she had to cut her finger off, she might not have gone. But she thought she had the key, so no problem. Then she got there and it was too late. That's why I love I love fairy tales for those kinds of, that kind of wisdom. Oh, I agree. I read fairy tales all the time. They're, they're beautiful stories, really. There's just so much to say in each of them. Right. And I love, I love the real ones. I mean, Disney's good, but, you know, that's entertainment. But, I, you know, I love in Cinderella, the real Cinderella, when the doves come down and peck out the bad sister's eyes. That's what they get. Yes, yes, I know. Some of the, you know, original fairy tales or folk tales can be quite dark yeah. and pretty interesting. I mean, the Snow White, the evil queen, how she, you know, is kind of dancing forever. In her yeah, dances, dances to death in those hot shoes. Dances, dances to death in those hot shoes. You don't see that in the Disney cartoon. Yeah, you do not. But it's one reason I love it, because bad people really get it in the end, if only they did in real life. Right. right. <laughs> I know it, you know, it's quite simple. Right but, right. but deep at the same time. Right. Yes. You know, as far as my writing process goes, 
this sounds so kind of snotty. <laughs> and I'm, I don't, I'm many things, but I'm not really snotty. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, these days, you know, in, in medieval times, there were scribes and they sat in their scriptoriums and uh, scriptoria, I guess, and copied sacred texts down that were already there. So for your younger readers, you know, when you see those books that are illuminated, those books that have little tiny pictures along the text and they're painted uh, in bright colors, you know, scribes did that, monks did that. And they were just copying down already texts that were there. And I try to think of myself now as a scribe. I try to write down what is already there. I just try to get my ego out of it as much as possible and let, let the story, it's sort of what you said, let the story tell me what it wants to be. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful way of looking at it, that you're the scribe. Right. I just feel like, you know, I, I teach writing at uh, Leslie Universities in, in uh, low residency, Masters of Fine Arts and Creative Writing. And I'm always saying to my students, get out of the way. Let the story come forward. The story has to be first. You're, you're the secretary. <laughs> That's true. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that for my own stories. It's good advice. Let me know how it works out for you. I will. I'll let you know. Don't call me at three o'clock threatening to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> So um, in The Seventh Raven, we can't look at it right now. So hopefully everyone's going to go check out the book and look at it. But Rovina Kai created beautiful and haunting illustrations throughout the novel. Was this your idea to add in illustrations, publishers? I knew that I always wanted to have illustrations in it. And um, my editor at Houghton Mifflin, who's published all three of these verse novels, Kate O'Sullivan um, is very indulgent and kind of lets me lets me do what I want sometimes. But she herself is so so good with the visual stuff. She's super smart and um, has a wonderful eye. And so when I I had chosen someone who's not a children's illustrator, but who is so weird and scary. And she said, that's, she said, no, that's, that's not right. Let me give you some other choices. And one of the choices, you know, we looked at four different people. And to me, Rovina's art was just perfect for the book. And I think she did an incredible, incredible job. She enhanced the book so much. I, I, you know, I really admire and appreciate what she did. Yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. I really re recommend that everyone um, scrolls through the book, looks at th the different pictures. It really enhances the story, like you're it saying. Does. It, it does. does. It really does. So what part of the book was the hardest to write for you? That book was all so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it. <laughs> <laughs> the whole damn thing. <laughs> it, it, it really was, you know, it's hard to know in the actual fairy tale. Uh, the girl first, when she leaves home to look for her brother, she goes to the sun and then she goes to the moon. And then the morning star, Venus, gives her the key that she needs. And it was really hard trying to figure out how to substitute. I didn't want to write a science fiction version of it with her <laughs> traveling in space. So it was hard to know how to, how to translate that into something that made sense. So I, I had, instead of the sun, I had a King instead of the moon, she sees the queen. And instead of the, morning star she meets a crone on the road 
But originally, that was a talking bear. And in some ways, I wish, I wonder what would have happened if I'd stuck with the talking bear. It's interesting to ponder and think about yeah. the talking bear. Might have been cool. I like yeah. the crone, though. It feels very, even though the crone isn't in the original grim fairy tale, the crone feels like it would be in a, a grim fairy tale. Well, there are plenty of crones in there. Yes, there's plenty of crones, so it feels rather natural. <laughs> yeah, the, crones, the crone is my favorite character in the book. I like the crone. I, li- I like the crone's perspective. Yeah. Of like, I'm moving you along your path, and I'm not telling you everything yet, but it's... Right, and kind of it's up to you. Are you going to make the choice or not? Right, so I'm helping you, but it's still your own choice. It's still about your own agency. Right, and that to me, that to me is such an important thing for your younger listeners and readers to, and such a hard thing to grapple with because... You know, I'll speak directly to them. You're at an age where everybody is telling you what to do. Your teachers, your minister, your parents, your aunts and uncles, everybody. And it's it's hard to find out who you who you are when everybody is uh, controlling you. So, oh dear, I, I feel like I'm going to get in trouble now with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> What, what you have to balance, let me put it this way. You have, to, you have to learn to balance that with what you also know about yourself. But, you know, when you're younger, you're still learning about yourself. So you make mistakes and you, you just have to be careful not to make mistakes that have dire circumstances for you. Well, I definitely think that April comes to find herself throughout the book on her journey, like leaving, she has to kind of leave everything behind to go save her brothers. It's definitely a journey for her. Right. I I love when she says at one point, she says something like, you know, I left my childish innocence behind. My childhood is fading. And um, eventually that has to happen, but I hope everybody can keep a little bit of their innocence, no matter how old you are yes hold on to it it's it's a good quality to have it is you, you need, need it for imagination to... say it again i said you need to hold on to it for at the very least imagination yes that is so right are you working on any other novels in verse coming up or what's next for you well i have three things going on i usually have multiple things happening at once i'm kind of add <laughs> so, um, I have a younger middle grade book, not in verse, about a very, very poor child. My, I don't want to say more about that. It's funny, though. Okay. Uh, I, I do have an idea for two more novels in verse. Both of them require some research. And then my son and I are working on a big kind of not like Harry Potter, but that's length of book, older middle grade novel right now. And uh, we've just had an offer on it from a publisher. Oh, congratulations. That's exciting. Thank you. Yeah. So we, we've we written only the first three chapters. So we've got a lot of work to do. A lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's true. So... What advice would you give to aspiring poets or writers? Any advice, particularly to teen writers? Yeah, I think it's my advice is so boring. But the first piece of advice is read. Read everything you can. Read widely. Read fiction. Read nonfiction. Read poetry. Read trashy stuff read the classics, read everything and as much as you can. That will, that's every writer I know, especially as a younger person, read like crazy. That's one thing. The second thing is write as much as you can. 
And this is kind of strange advice, but keep it secret. You have to protect it. You know, writing, it's your innermost self in many ways. And the world can be harsh. So until you actually feel ready, keep it secret, protect it. That's your job. And then I think my third piece of advice is don't listen to any advice. That's not really true. I mean, in, in the end, the, I think those, those things, reading, everything, writing, and take, you know, protecting it. And part of protecting it is taking the work seriously. You have to take it seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. That's so tedious. Yes, yes, very true. Right, you don't want to be an artiste. <laughs> yes, you know, take it seriously, but not too seriously and have fun. Right. Enjoy writing, even though it's hard. Even though it's hard. I like who said, uh, who said, I hate writing, I love having written. Hmm. I don't know who said that. I think I've heard it before, though. Yeah, I forget who said it. Like, I forget almost everything. Hmm. You know, we all do. There's little quotes that stick in our head, but I can't remember half the time where it comes from. Yeah, that's right. Very true. So for everyone listening to this, interested in checking out The Seventh Raven or your other books, or simply want to follow you on social media, where can they best find you? Well, they can go to my website, davidelliotbooks.com, two L's and two T's in Elliot. Embarrassingly, I am locked out of Facebook, <laughs> but not because, of any, <laughs> not because of any bad thing I did. Uh, somebody was, they sent me a message and said, oh, somebody's trying to hack your site, change your password. I changed my password. Then they said, okay, put in the six digit verification code that you asked for. I never asked for it. I never got the code and I uh -oh. cannot, I can't get it. Uh oh. So eventually I hope I'm there. And I'm also uh, on Instagram. I think it's D Elliot one, two, three, four, or D, I think it's D A L, I don't know. D A Elliot one, two, three, four. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and having this great conversation. Autumn, I enjoyed it so much. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, no, it was perfect. Uh, um, and I, I really enjoyed talking to you. It's great to talk yes. to uh, another writer. And also, thank you for your good work as a librarian. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for your work as a writer and sharing your stories with the world. Well, we'll see what the world says about that. But, <laughs> but no, you can just put it out there. You yeah, you got to put there. it out there. And then got to be brave and put it out there. That's it. That's right. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Autumn. I really enjoyed it. Well, that's all for today's podcast episode of YA Book Lovers. Thanks for listening, and thank you to David Elliott for joining me today to talk about The Seventh Raven. Join us again in the fall, after summer reading, when we talk about more YA. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Plus, you can also stop by our website at pvlib.net slash teens to discover all the latest teen programs at Prescott Valley Public Library.